So what is gin? I'm gonna blow your mind. Gin is flavored vodka. That's, that's accurate, actually. <laughs> Uh, today on How to Drink, we're talking about gin, the history of gin, what is gin, and looking at the various types of gin. Will this be exhaustive? Absolutely not. That's not something that will be the context of this episode. We will talk about the various types of gin and what they are, and we're going to taste them and talk about how they're uh, different and, and uh, how you can use them. Uh, we're going to a little bit talk about the history of gin and where it comes from. So gin is a distilled spirit, and the main thing that unifies and ties together everything into the family of things we would call gin is that they are predominantly flavored with juniper. Most gin is going to start its life as a neutral grain spirit um, that is then infused with botanicals, predominantly juniper. This makes gin essentially flavored vodka, if you prefer. It also makes vodka essentially incomplete gin, if you prefer. I suppose there's two ways to look at that. That definition, that it's a distilled spirit where the predominant flavoring is juniper is a bit subjective. Um, and so there's some stuff on the market that it will be called gin that not everybody agrees should really be called gin. Um, I don't have any brands in mind off the top of my head. I just know that there is frequently some debate around, well, you know, that's, I don't know if that's gin or not. Um, and that's kind of okay. That's just sort of the way things work. So uh, there's a bit of a myth that gin was invented by an alchemist. Does the defense's case hold water? By the name of Francisus Silvius de Bouve, who lived 1614 to 1672. This doesn't really hold water though. The defense is wrong. Because by the time this guy was born, Holland already had laws and a history of laws regarding the taxation and regulation of Yennefer, which is a kind of gin. It's, some people would say it's a predecessor to gin, but for our purposes, it's really, it's all part of gin. It is gin. -dom. As a matter of fact, gin is just really Jennifer translated into English, uh, as I have read. I don't know that that's 100% true. I mean, who knows what we don't know? I don't know what I, I mean, this is like, it's, you look at the thing, you say, well, that sounds a little, but I guess that's what it is. You've checked three more sources and they all say the same thing. You know, it's tough to know if that's not true, true, true. I hope it's true. For the love of God, I hope it's true. Um, I have read elsewhere that the distillation, distilled spirits flavored with juniper from that region, Holland, Northern Europe, they, they go back to like the 1200s. They've been around for a really long time. Really, gin shows up in Northern Europe basically at the dawn of distillation. I'm going to talk now about the different types of gin, and the history of gin kind of goes along with that. There's a bit of a progression through time here in these bottles. But first, a word from this episode's sponsor, Flaviar. And if you're here and don't know about Flaviar, well, you should. Because Flaviar was made exactly for people just like you. Flavor explorers questing after the perfect bottle. And what's the perfect bottle? Well, that's different for everyone. And that's why with a Flaviar subscription, you get a tasting box and a premium bottle every quarter. You're not limited to one. You can always purchase more delivered directly to your doorstep. And the experts at Flaviar are always coming up with new tasting boxes built around brilliant themes every month. Aged gins, tropical rums, Hemingway's favorites. Yes, thank you. But Flaviar is more than a box of magic in the mail. It's a community, a club for you to meet with your fellow flavor explorers and compare notes. You'll get invited to exclusive events to meet and mingle with your fellow flavor explorers and the folks behind the brands. You're ready to try new things more often and become a bona fide spirits aficionado and Flaviar is where you start drinking better. Click the link in the description below to join the Flaviar membership club and also subscribe to their YouTube channel. That's right there too. And back to the episode. I'm gonna talk about Jennifer. Yennefer. Um, you could, I think that the pronunciation of that, Jennifer and Yennefer, I don't know, I've heard pronounced both ways. I think that honestly one is the Dutch tradition or the Dutch pronunciation and one is the English pronunciation. I already thought I had a Boomsma <laughs> Yennefer uh, around, I, I don't have, but I do have uh, this uh, Genevieve uh, traditional 17th century style Yennefer gin pot stilled in San Francisco actually. Um, the traditions associated with gin of course, evolve with the evolution of distillation. We're talking about the earliest style of gin here, Yennefer. This is a malt wine that has been distilled in a pot still. Um, 
What I've read is that the reason that they started flavoring this with juniper, which turned it into Jennifer, um, is because they didn't really like what they were getting out of the still. The malt wine had a lot of impurities in it. The pot still wasn't very good. They weren't really skilled at utilizing a pot still to remove those impurities, to remove those flavors that they didn't want. And so instead what they got really good at, it was doing juniper, jun juniper. Uh, they started, they got good at doing juniper infusions and other kind of botanical infusions. So I have a glass here. Uh, we're gonna give a taste of this pot still style Yennefer. It does have a very malty nose too. Very malty. It's malt and juniper. That's exactly, it's very pleasant. It's nice. It's, um, it's got that kind of sweet cereal smells. It's very nice. Very round. Sweet, but I mean, it's not sweet, like, like sweet, sweet, like sugar water sweet, but like it has a sweetness to it, like a whiskey. Um, I, honestly, I would say that this in some ways reminds me of the maltiness in a, um, in monkey shoulder. It doesn't have the same flavor profile at all because of the juniper. It has a much sharper uh, kind of astringent juniper profile. And I get a lot of raisiny stuff in there. So I'm wondering if they're doing, for me, I when, if, when generally when I find I taste raisins, it means it was aged in sherry casks. I would not be surprised. It has another color, so that we may have stripped that out. But I would not be shocked to learn that this had spent a little time in an old sherry piece, in, in old sherry wood. I'll give it another shot though. I get it really like, almost. this tastes almost like raisin bran to me as a drink because of the malt cereal thing and then that raisin the aftertaste and, and and that's a flavor synthesis i think though i think that because it, it's somewhere in between the two it does slip right through juniper a little spicy i like it and so uh Genever is the style of gin that you're going to find kind of throughout europe for a really long time up until mid 1700s in the 18th century old tom gin becomes pretty popular and this is Heyman's old tom and uh it's been pretty popular around my house as you can see i have very little of it left so old Tom's a bit tricky. When you look into, well, what's the legal definition of an old Tom? Uh, you will find, unless my research is very incomplete, that there really isn't one. It can be made from malted grains. It can be made from, you know, any uh, agricultural product like a standard gin. It can be done in a pot still. It can be done in a column still. It can be aged. It could be not aged. It could be sweetened or not. Typically, I think that they are sweetened. Um, and basically, old Tom sort of becomes a catch-all for all the gins that don't fit the other categories of gin, even if they don't adhere to it. Like I, I think Uncle Val's might be an old Tom, but they don't call themselves an old Tom. So let's have a taste here of the old Tom. Way more junipery. This is a lot more juniper present than um, the Yennefer. Also, none of that malty sweetness. So I don't know what they're using as a base here or how the process is with old Heyman's, but off, without knowing that, I can taste that probably a column still was involved there at some point. I bet that was probably made more or less like a London Dry, which we will explain in a moment when we get to London Dry. Um, and then sweetened. It's definitely sweet. There's definitely some sugar content in this. <laughs> I'll be shocked. I watch, I find out, like, nope, none. Yeah. <laughs> but as far as I can tell, there's definitely a little sugar in this. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's a little sweet, actually. I think that if you were going to use that in a drink and you wanted to balance it, you might want to think about not using too much other sweet stuff. It's not sweet like a liqueur, but when you would compare that to other, like certainly sweet, very sweet compared to a London dry gin or any other, you know, whiskeys or anything like that, if you were to compare it to it, it's, it's got sugar added to it. I'm certain of that. You can taste that. I'm pretty sure. Pretty, pretty sure. Pretty, pretty. Where does the name Old Tom come from? That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't know if this story is true or not. I know parts of this story are based in truth. So during the 1700s, there was a gin craze in England. People were drinking a lot of gin and there were some laws passed to kind of control that. Um, a very serious laws. There's the Gin Acts. There was uh, other laws. Anyway, uh, the Gin Act caused a riot, actually. Uh, and so apparently there was some kind of a thing where there would be a slot underneath a black cat sign and you could like knock and put a coin in a little lead tube would shoot a slug of gin out for you to catch in a cup this is how they did speakeasies in the 1700s i don't buy that that sounds ridiculous that is some uh <laughs> that's that is some sherlock holmes as directed by guy Ritchie stuff to me i don't think that that's like for real i mean i hope it's for real just like you know 
uh, rakish ne'er-do-wells slinking down alleyways to suck gin out of a lead tube for a for a pocket of coin. Uh, I feel like that's very nice, but I wonder how historically accurate that is. It's a great story, though. And there might be some truth in that, that Old Tom got its name from being the gin that was served at these Old Tom speakeasies of the 1700s. That might be true. One thing about Old Tom, too, is that a lot of people refer to Old Tom as the missing link between the Yennefer styles and the London Dry styles. So maybe we should go to London Dry next. We're gonna do a London Dry gin. Uh, curiously, this is a London Dry gin from California. That's okay. It's still good. So, cause London Dry is not a regional appellation. Uh, it is a style of gin. And so to make a London Dry gin, you gotta start with your neutral grain spirits. So London Dry gin, the evolution, wait, wait, what is the fun? Well, you're supposed to pour to the widest part of the glass. That's how they're supposed to work. So, <laughs> that's one of the reasons I don't love these glasses. Cause like to use the glass properly, you're supposed to fill to there so that the vapors do a thing. I don't know. Anyway, so the history of London dry gin and the evolution of London dry gin is developed, is dependent on the development of the coffee still, which is a kind of column still. It's the earliest kind of column still, or it's at least a very early kind of column still. You need that style of still to um, to make very pure spirits that are very high in alcohol content. A column still, once we had the uh, the coffee still, we could distill pretty pretty quickly up to something that was 95 or 90 percent alcohol content. So pretty neutral spirits at that point. There's not much left other than ethanol. The other thing you can do with those is they can a column still can be run continuously, where you are continuously feeding new. Um, mash i guess it's mash yeah where you're continuously feeding new mash into it and continuously pulling new spirit off the other end you don't have to do like a batch you could just have it run 24 hours a day making alcohol as long as you can feed booze into it beer so you take that the rectified spirit i guess is what comes out this 95 or 90 percent uh spirit and then you do a second distillation with it in that second distillation you're going to put it back into a pot still and uh you're going to hang so if you've seen these pot stills and actually i have one but it's not here with us right now, but that's okay. Um, you see a pot still, the style of pot still, a lot of them have, you know, there's always a pot, some kind of a, a chamber for the wash at the bottom, and then uh, an arm that goes to a condensing coil, right? And this is called a line arm. Uh, well, there's sometimes a, what looks like two pots, a pot and then what they call an onion head. You would hang inside that head something called a gin basket. Basically, it's a tea bag filled with botanicals. Um, juniper, for sure orange peels, lemon peels, rosemary, whatever you want to add and infuse into your gin. You take your spirit in the bottom, you heat it up, it turns into vapor. The vapors, I mean, they are hot, they are under pressure, they suck oils and flavors and stuff like that, essence out of all those botanicals, come up the line arm and then condense in a coil and what comes out is your flavored gin. Still 95% alcohol, cut it back with some water, boom, we've got London Dry Gin. No sugar added. And so that's it. That's true. That is what London Dry Gin got to start in a column still, move to a pot still with a gin basket, and uh, and that's it. So you need a column still before you can make London Dry Gin. That's why it couldn't exist before then. Um, I guess there's still some debate about this. I thought it was a settled matter. I am willing to concede that it may be not the case, but that like a dry martini was really just a differentiation at that point of saying, I would like my martini made with London dry gin, not please make my martini with as little vermouth as possible. Ah, there's some debate about that. I think that's what it means, but I've been told maybe that's not what I mean. That's what I've read. That's what David Wonder seems to, I think that's what David Wonder said in imbibe. Maybe I'm misremembering. I don't know. So we've got here Ford's London dry gin. Let's have a sippy. Very sharp, very, I mean, some would say very piney, but certainly very juniper-y. Bright, floral, uh, tart. I like it. Even as a London Dry, I would say this is still a little sweet, but not very, very sweet. You get a little bit of um, roundness to it. It's not overly astringent, not overly sharp or biting. It's nice, it's very nice. Certainly this is less sweet and less malty than either the Old Tom, way less sweet than the Old Tom, way less malty than the Jennifer. Um, so, I mean, these three guys could not really be much further apart from each other, right? Okay, so Plymouth Gin. So it's, it's tricky because Plymouth 
used to be a whole style of gins that were protected as being made in Plymouth, England. There's only one brand left, Blackfriars Distillery Plymouth Gin. So to say what is Plymouth Gin, what's in this bottle is Plymouth Gin. You won't find any other examples as far as I know. Very possible there may be some micro distillers trying to get it going. The main difference here that we're gonna find is that while Juniper is of course still our lead flavor, those secondary things, those orange peels, those, um, you know, that's those citrusy notes are going to be replaced here with roots um, from what I've read about Plymouth Gin. Um, and it's going to have a much uh, earthier, much, I would, I'm thinking it's gonna be more bitter, much earthier flavor uh, and certainly less sweet than a, uh, more sweet than maybe a London Dry, but less sweet than an Old Tom. Let's go. This is less juniper forward, less bright, definitely a little more muted in flavor, a little more bitter, a little bit more earthy. There's not, I don't know, maybe people are gonna shake in their heads right now, you know, <laughs> gin fiction. I was like, if you can't really seriously tell the difference between a London Dry and a Plymouth Gin, I can, but I'm just gonna say, if you put five London Dries in glasses and this in one and did a blind taste test, I guarantee you would have a hard time picking this as being somehow not part of the spectrum of a London Dry Gins. I mean, it's pretty... If I told you this was a style of London Dry Gin, it would be very close. What's interesting to me is that it is made in a pot still, as opposed to a column still. Yeah, I don't think there's a second distillation. I think this is made in a single distillation, and yet it is very close to being a London Dry style gin. It's, it's definitely adjacent, different, not identical, don't get me wrong. And in fact, these two happen to be very far apart. But what I'm saying is that in the world of London Dry Gins, you could, I would say that you could tell somebody this fits into there as being slightly, as, as, a, as a type, an example, without it needing to be a completely different category. That's all I'm saying. So now we're gonna talk about something you'll see occasionally mentioned, or you'll see it for sale in places, Pink Gin. So Pink Gin comes about because, um, <laughs> The British Royal Navy prescribed their surgeons, their ship surgeons in the 1800s would prescribe Angostura bitters to cure seasickness. Don't know how much effective that would have been. Um, and apparently British sailors didn't love drinking Angostura bitters straight, so they would mix it with gin, which they thought was great to drink straight. And that's where you get pink gin from. And it is pink. It's very, very pink. It's, it's quite pretty. It almost looks like a rosé. And so this is uh, Gin Lane 1751. It's named for the 1751 Gin Acts, uh, which are made famous by the painting Gin Lane um, and also the riots that followed. Uh, and they're telling us flat out, it's got cassia bark, angelica, Sicilian lemon, coriander, orris root, Seville orange, juniper, and star anise. Um, and that sounds quite lovely. Let's give it a shot. Mm. Whoa. This smells like fish. <laughs> I'm switching glasses. So I have not had Gin Lane 1751 before. I, I washed out that glass, I put this in there and it smelled very, very like like actual fish. So I got another glass just in case there's something in that glass. Maybe that glass wasn't clean enough. Let's see if, I wanna give this guy a shot. I wanna see if it still tastes or smells like fish. It's a weird thing, maybe they're going for that. It smells like fish, guys. So Gin Lane 1751 smells like fish. I don't know, and not like, not like good fish. Um, let's put it in my mouth. It doesn't taste like fish. And it's not very juniper forward either. It's not bad actually, I like it. It's, if anything, maybe cinnamon. I mean, it's not hot and spicy like cinnamon, but maybe cinnamon is the dominant flavor here. Yeah, I would say compared to the other gins, it's muted. It's got l much less pronounced flavors, sharper flavors than like a London Dry. It's just not as present. Um, I'm having actually kind of a hard time putting my finger on what I'm tasting here. We'll go one more time on the fish gin. Yeah, juniper. It's got a... No sweetness, but like a mild bitterness. It's bitter. In an experiential kind of way. Not like in a way that, oh, that tastes like bitter, but like it feels a little bitter. I think I get a little bit of the cinnamon, maybe the ca which is cassia, it's a kind of cinnamon. Um, okay, pink gin. I, I don't really love the gin lane, but I thought we should talk about it. There's a lot of stuff on the market that is essentially modified gin. 
Um, and there's a couple of, you know, the gin based liqueurs that are out there. You'll see referenced in Cold War and drinks. Um, one very famous gin based liqueur is, um, why can't I think of it right now? It's uh, Pim's Cup. Pim's Cup is a liqueur made from gin. Well, that's not true. Pim's Cup number one or whichever, the one that you normally see in the store here in the States is Pim's Cup is made from gin. Pim's actually makes a number of other um, liqueurs made from other spirits. But traditionally, uh, but the one that you, most people associate with Pim's Cup is made from gin. And then there is something called, uh, and then also there's a more, I like Pomps and Whim Whimsy is an interesting liqueur. They're kind of new to the market. They are a gin-based liqueur. Um, but the one that's sort of less brand-centered and that you'll see a lot of is Slow Gin. You'll see recipes call for Slow Gin a lot. Uh, slow Gin is, is, is a liqueur made by infusing sloes, which is the fruit of blackthorn, into gin. Um, this particular one, I, apparently a lot of times it's actually not even necessarily gin. It's just like neutral grain spirits and slow and stuff like that. I think your quality... Um, slow gins like sip smiths are going to be starting out as real gin that they then take a next step further we've rested slow berries on our award-winning london dry gin so this slow gin started out as sip smiths london dry um i don't have a bottle here present but it's a it's a nice it's very approachable very sippable london dry gin um not not super tart not real astringent flavor so pretty mild to begin with actually and then they've rested slow berries on it and it's been deproofed down to 29%, so 60 proof. Um, and let's see how this is. Smell fruit right away, of course. Very, very smelly. No fish. Woo! That is an unusual thing. I like that. Oh, man. That tastes like the smell of playing NES in my friend's potpourri encrusted basement when I was seven years old, man. That is a that is a flavor that takes me right back. That is wild. Remembering had that little robot with the spinning tops. You're playing with the Nintendo Entertainment System. That is a very floral flavor. Very, I mean, like potpourri a little bit. It is nice. It's sweet. It's not overly sweet. I don't think that. I know there are drinks that call for this, but you can certainly drink this on its own. It kind of reminds me of like blackberries or something like that. I don't know that I've ever had slow. I don't think I've ever had just blackthorn fruits on their own. It does have a very, um, and I don't want this to sound unpleasant, but like there is a, a, a boom. It comes up into your sinuses. It's very much like a potpourri. Uh, the juniper is, for the most part, I, I don't really taste the juniper. It's mostly this berry flavor, this berry flavor with that potpourri thing that happens in there for a minute. Um, that's cool. I like that a lot. Worlds apart from anything else out here. I mean, completely different level of alcohol content, completely different flavor profile. And yet we have to talk about it. You know, it becomes, it's part of the world of gin. The world of gin. Gin. I hope it was instructive at the very least to give you a baseline idea of what different types of gin are that you think you will encounter. Are there other things out there that you're gonna encounter? Sure. I just felt like pink gin, slow gin, London dry, Plymouth gin, uh, Genever and Old Tom are the ones that you're going to see written about in recipes, that you're going to encounter, that you're going to hear about, and that this would help give you a baseline understanding of what they're like. This is How to Drink Show. I made cocktails and how to drink them today. I didn't make a single damn cocktail. I just tasted gin and talked about ginstery, which is how I like to say gin history, the ginstery. Um, it's not her story. It's not his story. It's gin story. I'm on Twitter at How to Drink. I'm on Instagram at How to Drink. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. I have a Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HGD. Check that out. I hope you will. All of my barware is provided by Barfly Mixology Gear. I didn't use any of it today because this was a gin tasting episode. So it didn't really, it wasn't called for, but that's where I would get it. If, I was using. if you want to buy some of the barware you normally see me use on the show, you'll find it in the pinned comment below. If you like this kind of thing, you want to see me tasting stuff like this, leave me a comment. Let me know what else you want me to do. And I will get right on that sometime in the future. I did a video that's sort of like this where I did a bunch of different scotch highballs kind of exploring, well, the scotch highball, actually. Uh, I framed it around Winston Churchill. You know, not maybe the wisest move, but I did it. I did an episode where I tasted some absinthe. Maybe you wanna check that out. Check out my other stuff. Don't stop watching How to Drink, ever. There's more How to Drink where that came from. That's my new catchphrase. That's how we're gonna close it. Hey, if you like this episode, there's more How to Drink where that came from. So check them out. Shooter.
champ, slugger, tiger. tiger. <laughs>